Putin's orig Putin originally thought that's what Russia wants to do. That's been the history of the Soviet Union, and that has been from um, from especially from Putin onwards in, into Russia, that has been like the Russian strategy and the Russian game plan. I don't think you can steal man Putin's position. I think he's legitimately like a monster crazy dictator dude. <laughs> I don't know if there is like a, um, I don't know if there's a good steel man position. For, well, I guess the steel man position is going to come. Do you think if Putin goes after Estonia or something, NATO will actually defend it? it that you have to. I've also thought about like the doomsday shit. When Putin talks, the goal isn't to be What's your take on the NATO expansionism argument? The NATO exp I'm actually a little bit embarrassed um, because I think even I've unintentionally wielded some conventional knowledge about NATO that is actually just completely false. There is absolutely no NATO expansionist argument whatsoever. It is absolutely fake, absolutely false, absolute fucking bullshit. No if you know anything mm -hmm. about the geography, the history, the timelines, there is no way in the world can you ever say NATO expansionism explains modern day Russian aggression. It requires a total lack of understanding of everything in the region and in that, those periods in time. Um, but I, I, I feel like my brain has expanded seven times in relation to <clears throat> at least from the 90s and onward. Soviet, Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact, all that shit. Are you going to apologize for calling me biased that one time when I said Eastern Europe is justified in seeking NATO's protection? Um, yeah, if I did say that, what an incredibly retarded thing to say. Because when you look at the actions of post-91 Russia, I totally understand why countries are like, you know what? Um, I kind of want to be, I kind of want to be a NATO, you know? I don't want to be like, um, I have to go, all I've done is reading because I hate fucking watching videos. I don't trust any of it. So I don't know how to pronounce anything. Um, there was the, you've got like the conflict in Medova. You've got the separation of, it's like Azak or whatever and the Odessa or in the Oseta, whatever bullshit in Georgia. Like basically Russia will just fuck with and take over whatever the fuck they think they can get into. They'll send peacekeeping troops, they'll help separatist groups, they'll stir up shit, and then eventually they'll just be like, we're gonna roll in our army. Like the story with Georgia is almost identical to the story with Ukraine. It's almost the exact same thing. There were some, sep like a pro-Western president gets elected in <clears throat> 2003, says, hey, we're kind of looking to, and then Russia's like, uh, hold on there, buddy. And then it boils over into 2008, Russia's like, hey, you know, there's some two independent states here. Part of your country, we recognize them as being independent. We're going to send in people to make sure. That it's like the exact same story as Ukraine. But, I, but m the more I see how Russia functions, um, the more I see how Russia operates, now I understand that, like, when you're a country, like, wh like, who knows what would have happened in places like Poland or Hungary or Romania uh, if they hadn't been... Uh, part of it, like uh, NATO. I, like I totally, I, I 100% understand that now. I understand the perspective of like Eastern Europe and wanting to be part of NATO so much more. Um, did you see the Noam Chomsky? I haven't watched him yet, but I have a feeling he gives a retard anti-America take about it, but I'll have to go, I would have to go and watch it. Also, I don't know if it was Rage Pope or somebody else, people have linked, there's some guy that talks about um, how, the, how, how Ukraine is the West's fault. He has a 12 page paper or something that he wrote on it. This Mearshemeyer guy, this is, all of this is bullshit. It's even written poorly. Like it's absolute bullshit. N nothing in here is substantiated. The guy himself, not to character assassinate, but like supports like fucking weird neo-Nazi, like Holocaust vision shit. This guy is a loser. Um, and if you've ever seen, I think there's a one and a half hour lecture that he gives or whatever. This guy is absolutely fucking crazy. <sighs> Uh, I read some of the stuff from my international um, relations theory class and every article was utter dog shit. Yeah, it's just, but I, this is the thing that I see cited the most. Um, and then he's got like this hour and 15 minute lecture as well. This foreign affairs um, site is, oh God. This one and I think fair, there's one other. I have genuinely wanted to gauge, gauge, gauge my own eyes. Oh, I haven't watched any of what Haas has said. I probably need to. Russia actions 100 proving why these countries should want to join NATO. Um. Well, I um I, I don't know I should watch this stuff so I know what to respond to but I like I just I can't possibly 
I was just debating the Ukraine situation with Richard Spencer. Oh yeah, maybe I'll watch. I can't imagine what you could say. Like now, now that I like it is. Stop stuffing your fat. I feel mouth. like it's hard to find such clear-cut situations of people being so obviously in the wrong, and um, yeah, Jesus. Fucking dubstep. I, I said it has an Hinkle debate on I'm Thursday. I'm skipping all of these and pausing these. I don't know why. Okay. Um, ha said Ukraine was developing mm -hmm. weapons to target Russians by DNA. My mom linked me the same fucking Facebook Instagram post. I saw this. I don't. I don't know what the fuck. Yeah, it's just like crazy shit. <clears throat> the Ukrainian government was literally hosting U.S. bioterrorism and U.S. biological warfare laboratories on its fucking soil. And you're telling me that the Ukrainian government was not anti-Russian? Pepe Escobar would probably come on your show. You're telling me they're not anti-Russian? This guy is unhinged. Um, glad to see you did research on Russia. You're going to speculate on possible outcomes. It seems like, what, so there are a few military analysts people suggest that I follow on Twitter, but people give so many conflicting takes. Based on like the amalgamation of stuff I've read, it seems to be the case that Putin's orig Putin originally thought he would meet far less resistance in Ukraine. The goal was to just send a few detached battalions in a haphazard manner to steamroll into Kiev very quickly. Um, T toss out the leadership, hold a new election, fit, like super peace, basically keep East Ukraine, and then like peace out. That that was like the, um, that was like the dream, I guess, or the goal. But apparently, they met more resistance than they thought. So now they've kind of had to take a step back, and they've had to reconsider. And now they're like doing a more serious, like military campaign now. Whereas before, everything was unimaginably haphazard, like running armor out like without pr appropriate supply lines like applying forces in ways that just were, were very reckless um but the the conventional knowledge that i see among like russian military experts is that now russia is probably going to reconsider refocus gather everything and then do a more controlled expansion into ukraine but the goal is to make it pretty quick like they don't want a protracted conflict because the longer it goes on the worse they look and they also probably don't want to like shell the fuck out of the city and make everything like completely fucked does ukraine not stand a chance anymore i have not read anybody credible saying that um ukraine ever stood a chance we see a lot of memes on Twitter and Reddit that make it look like Ukraine is like destroying the Russian military, but the reality is it's just a few like reckless units that are being used in pretty stupid ways. Russia hasn't even begun their air game yet. It hasn't even started. Uh, the majority of their armor and artillery, which is what they're known for, hasn't gotten anywhere near like the battle yet. Um, all of that is like in the process of rolling it out. Like, but could things change? You know, maybe. But I, most people that I've read still seem to think that um, Russia is going to absolutely obliterate any resistance they meet um, when they finally get their war machine up and running. But there's a lot of other stuff in the meantime that leads to questions. Um, Russia's currency has like collapsed. The ruble is, I think, worth less than like a robuck now or something. A robux thing, or whatever, is insane. Um, I don't know if Russia actually thought the SWIFT stuff would happen. Why didn't they ramp it up faster? They've been half-assing it for so long now. Um, because I, because the, I think the goal was is that they legitimately thought that they legitimately thought they could get into Kiev and like depose Zelensky and just be done with it in like a few days. Um, I guess they underestimated the resistance or overestimated their own okay, I'm not sure, but... Destiny, video that tries to directly debunk the Mersheimer lecture. Um, honest to God, the thing that I read the most, I don't remember the Mersheimer guy says this, the, the, the most bullshit thing that I hear cited over and over again is the, um, is that the West promised in 1990, in 1989 and 1990, that we would never expand NATO to the east, that that would never happen. And our continual expansion of NATO to the east has been like antagonistic towards Russia. But that promise has never been made in all of history. And there's absolutely no reason to think that promise has been made. And if you go back and you look at the talks, 
and you understand what was happening at the, no, it's not verbal, no, 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 no. Okay, so it, no, okay, so like, the, and this is, because I admit, I don't know anything about history, but if you go back and you look at like, if, if you look at, if you look at the maps, it, th this question doesn't even make sense, right? Why would Gorbachev, just think about it, why would Gorbachev in 1990, okay, talk about NATO expanding to the east, right? Germany was divided into the GDR and Western Germany, right? Poland was part of the Warsaw Pact. Hungary, Romania, these were Warsaw Pact countries. And then you had um, the Euro Baltics, all of these countries were part of the Soviet Union. There was nowhere east for NATO to go. You had some like non aligned countries, I think. Um, but like NATO, there was no place to go. This was never, and Gorbachev has come out later and he said, no, we never talked about NATO expansion to the east ever. Um, Yugoslavia was there, yeah, but that, that's literally it. Like There were no places for, for NATO to go. This was never part of the conversation. The conversation, why are you suddenly speculating? I'm not speculating. Off yourself, you fucking moron. I got a permaban. See you later, dumb fuck. Go watch Vosher Hassan, okay? Suck all the dicks in the fucking world, and I hope you hate all of it. There you go. Um, <clears throat> there's a famous quote that the um, is quoted often by the U.S. Secretary of State. Um, I think his name was James Baker. And this quote that people throw at you over and over again, there it is, I just saw it in chat. Not one inch, it was not one inch eastward. But that's bullshit, it was never promised. Not one inch eastward was promised. But people quote that quote to make it sound like we were saying that NATO would never move one inch eastward. But that's actually not true. What it was quoting was Baker saying that if the reunification of Germany happened, and if the GDR, once reunified with Germany, joined NATO, that the military installations that NATO had in Germany would not move one inch eastward to threaten Soviet security interests. That's what the one inch, e and I've seen that, and I think I've even seen that in Yale lectures, where they say like, oh, NATO wasn't gonna move one inch eastward. That's bullshit. Now, to be fair, this is based on declassified documents in 2017, um, there was a whole bunch of shit, I think. I can't spell these fucking names. Um, there was a whole bunch of documents that were declassified, and you can read all of these, all of these notes, all of these cables that talk about the conversations that we had with the West German um, Chancellor, that we had with Gorbachev, the Soviet Union, um, all of these because conversations here. And you will find that if you go through this, okay, there is not a single guarantee there is not a single guarantee that there is this that NATO will not expand to the east to the east, and that one inch eastward thing always had to do with NATO military installations in eastern Germany in the in the reunified Germany in the GDR section. Um, that treaty is the reason why even today the U.S. doesn't have bases in eastern Germany. Yeah, it's just. Um, I'm not entirely sure on this, but isn't that Mershmeyer guy a fairly respected foreign policy professor? I, I, I don't know. I, I've done a little bit of like background research on him, but um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem credible at all. I, I wouldn't trust anything that he says on it, but that's just having read it. But hey, maybe I've read everybody. Uh, why is literally everybody always saying Russian talking points? Well, I don't know, because it sounded credible, but like, um, yeah, but I, when you go back and you like look at the maps and you figure out like, well, what's like, well, where the fuck would NATO even go? It starts to make less sense. Um, also, Russian expansionism, um, or, or, or Russia, Russia's military actions in regards to NATO expansionism also doesn't make sense, right? When you look at um, when you look at Russia taking over Crimea, right? This happened in 2014, and it was in response to um, Yakunovich. I now I always fuck these names up. I'm gonna memorize these names before before uh, Thursday. Um, Somebody type in a chat. It's not Yakunovich. It's not Yukonovich. It's not um, Yanukovych. I think it's Yanukovych. I think is how you pronounce it. I think it's Yanukovych or Yanuko Yanukovych. Um, the last two. I think the last two countries admitted to NATO were. Um, it was two thousand and nine, and it was like. Um, it was Croatia and. Um, fuck, what was it? It was Croatia and, I don't remember the second one, but it was like five years before any Crimea invasion, right? The invasion happened because he's mad as fuck that his little puppet boy got tossed out 
in Ukraine. That's why he invaded here. None of the uh, none of the military actions on the ground have been like in response to like any expansion of NATO or whatever. It's just it's all like all of it is absolute bullshit. When you like write out all the timelines, you look at it. Um, <clears throat> Croatia was 2013. Wait, hold on. I thought in 2009, two countries got added. It was Albania and Croatia in 2009, not 2013. I don't know why I said that. The latest was on North Macedonia. Yeah, there was, in, I think in 2013, North Macedonia, and then one other small country joined. I don't remember what it was called, but... um. A new issue that is coming up more and more are fringe PhDs and lectures going public to claim authority and no one checks their actual credibility within the field. Yeah, maybe. What do you think is the main driver behind Russia's actions if NATO expansion is not a factor? I think the main driver is that Russia sees the West as slowly falling and crumbling apart. I'm, I'm getting this narrative the more we, Russia sees the West as a declining power and Putin seeks to rebuild the old Soviet empire. That's like the goal. So when Putin sees territory that he can take, he will take it. When Putin sees a separatist movement that looks to be potentially loyal to the, to the to Russia, he'll back that movement, he'll send in people, he'll fuck up the um, he'll fuck up the government there, he'll steal territory and then that's what, he, what he'll do. Um, he's done it in Georgia, he's done it in um, Moldova. Um, there was another place. He's done it in Ukraine with Crimea and now with the rest of Ukraine, I guess. Um, I haven't read anything about the history of Belarus yet, so I don't make any strong comments on that, but. Destiny, I think they'd say that the fact that Gorbachev didn't even imagine NATO expanding further is actually evidence that NATO expanding in Eastern Europe is crossing the line. No, 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 because the problem is that, and I don't think people realize this at the time either, nobody, there were two huge things that happened. Nobody thought that Germany was going to reunify as quick as it did, and nobody knew the Soviet Union was gonna fall. Like, that, like that, it happened so quickly and so suddenly and so rapidly, and the, I don't think the United States even wanted the Soviet Union too fall. We wanted there to be a Soviet Union because instability in Europe has been a problem for so fucking long. And nobody wanted to see the Soviet Union collapse because people thought that it would end up being way violent, way more violent than it actually ended up being. But George Bush actually went to Ukraine and in Kiev, Kiev, he gave a speech. It's, it's People call it now the chicken Kiev speech. But he actually <laughs> gave a speech begging like the nine republics of the Soviet Union, like please ratify a treaty, work together. You guys can solve this. You don't have to break up or whatever. Like our own, our own US president was trying to tell people to like stay together and stick it out. I don't think anybody thought that the Soviet Union was gonna collapse or fall as apart as quickly as it did. Because I'm putting 100% Uh, Mearschmeyer is an extremely respected <laughs> international relations guy. I, I don't trust it. I'm sorry. I've read too much dumb shit about him and I've read too much dumb shit by him to take anything that guy says with, with any amount of credibility. Um. There were signs of the Soviet Union collapsing a few years prior. They had massive flood lines and other economic stress. Yeah, but it, like people will say that shit all the time. You're lying to yourself and to other people. Like because any state can collapse, and then people can go back. And go like, oh well, look at all the signs. They were there, right? Like if like if the United States collapsed in like 2015, people are like, oh well, look at 2007. Like obviously it was going to collapse. So it was the largest financial crisis in the world, right? I I, I, th I think it was largely unexpected across the world that the Soviet Union was going to collapse as quickly as it did. Maybe eventually, but. I think the real reason is Crimean oil reserves plus pipeline transport fees. Uh, I think there's military installations there as well, but pipeline stuff is pretty important too because I think pipeline stuff is why um, the names of these places are really complicated or they're just really weird. But there are two areas in Georgia that Russia now essentially owns because they declared them autonomous republics. I think it's it might be this area, this area, but there are pipelines that flow through there as well. I think that now they have like complete, yeah, I don't know if pronounce these, it's Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia, but. I called his delusional when he was first starting his Russia is good arc. Worth. Wait, who's starting a Russia is good arc? Oh, Haas. Well, I mean, he's a tanky. He's always thought Russia is good, right? Poopy poop. 
Do you ever feel like an NPC in like someone else's life? I reject this now. Um, I've become the biggest NATO cuck in the world after the past like week of reading shit. I'm sorry. I totally, totally, totally don't believe this shit anymore. Hold on. What did somebody say? There are multiple reasons why Russia doesn't want Ukraine to be a NATO. Nukes in backyard, the $250 billion in rescue Ukraine, a lot of resources here. Bullshit. I don't believe it. Russia doesn't want NATO to be in its backyard because Russia wants to fuck every country that it can and absorb them into its empire. That's what Russia wants to do. One million billion trillion percent. That's, that's been the history of the Soviet Union. And that has been from, um, from especially from Putin onwards in, into Russia, that has been like the Russian strategy and the Russian game plan. And that's why Russia doesn't want NATO anywhere near it. We looked at the Haas Hinkle talking points. There are some places that can trap you that aren't easy to argue from. It sounds like you're more on the side that NATO isn't just because we're Russian, but they will almost certainly do a what about, like a what about what? Thoughts on the Azov Battalion argument, killing people and shelling? The Azov Battalion people seem pretty shitty. Like that's that's one part that I need to research more. But like the Azov Battalion is like, like a quarter of them are neo-Nazis, but the battalion is like 2,500 people. And the Ukrainian military is like 200,000 active members. So taking like a part of this battalion and then arguing that all of Ukraine are neo-Nazis is like a little bit weird. Why are people putting so much pressure for the UN to do something about this war? I don't know, but the UN can't do anything. This is why NATO is so important, right? Because the UN Security Council, people like Russia or China can unilaterally shut down any type of effort to do anything. And I think this is why countries are kind of looking to NATO and wanting to join NATO. Um, because when you're part of NATO, like not to jerk us off, but like the US has got your back. If you're in NATO, nobody is fucking with you. And especially on a continent in Europe, no offense to you guys, you guys have a lot of crazy fucking shit going on. Especially in the, um, especially in, your, in the Southeast part of the country, where you fucking collapse of Yugoslavia, the Bosnia, the fucking, um, there's like, there's so much conflict that knowing that when you're in NATO, like everybody around you is like, ah, fuck. Can't, if he, he like touched the tree and you can't tag him anymore. It's just a, it's a really, really, really good assurance towards like building stability in your country. Um, so I like I understand now why other countries want the ability to join NATO, um, and I and I and now I'm a lot less warm to arguments. Be like, well, should they really be able to join NATO? Like, it's kind of shitty. It makes Russia uncomfortable. Meanwhile, all of these other Eastern European or I guess Central Asian, I don't know what you call like Azerbaijan and Georgia and all these countries, right? I, were they being considered European? Do people call them European? Um, I can understand why they're looking at us like, okay, but like, can we please join NATO? Like, we really don't, you know, like I, maybe like, just can you let us in or whatever? Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic now to other countries that really want to join NATO. Why do progressives hate NATO? Just, I think, because they just don't know anything about it. Которые, как известно, и несут прямую ответственность за геноцид на Донбассе и кровь мирных граждан народных республик. Кроме того, националистические элементы, внедренные в состав регулярных украинских частей, не только подстрекают их к оказанию вооруженного сопротивления, но по сути играют и роль заградатель. I'm so sorry. I was not your mother. If I was your mother, then you didn't have diamonds. I would sacrifice everything to get it. Мы видим это. Бендеровцы и неонацисты выставляют тяжелое вооружение, в том числе системы залпового огня, прямо в центральных районах крупных городов, включая Киев и Харьков. Они планируют вызвать ответный огонь российских ударных комплексов по жилым кварталам. По сути, они действуют... How are you going to counter Haas and Jackson saying 2014 um, was a US backed coup? Uh, that's that, that Mearsmeyer guy or whatever makes that argument, but he doesn't provide any fucking evidence for it. He just says it and you're supposed to believe it. Um, I think there was a minor amount of like supplies or humanitarian aid that went towards helping those people. But by and large, the majority of Ukraine doesn't want to be a part of Russia. The majority of Ukraine is looking west and not east for the future of their country. The majority of Ukraine wants further integration into things like the European Union or even, yes, NATO. The majority of Ukraine supports this. So the idea that that coup was like just a Western coup, that it was all CIA propped up and backed or whatever is bullshit. Even Crimea, 
where people are trying to say, oh, they wanted or they they voted to join Russia. Yeah, after Russia rolled tanks in and they I held their own like referendum. Crimea has no history of separatist fighting or violence in, in that peninsula ever. There was no history there until 2014 when Russia rolled fucking their military. And it's like, oh, well, we're going to take a vote now and see what you guys want to do. But that's what Russia does. That's, that's how they've always done it. That's how the Soviet Union functioned. You move in, you kill people, you take over a government, you install your own people, then you have your own elections, and then you vote to do everything like Russia wants. That's, that's how they function in the world. Because I'm putting 100%. Haas will 100% say that NATO has done bad stuff like bombing Yugoslavia and Libya, and that makes it justified for, Ru for Russia not want NATO on its borders. But NATO doesn't attack Russia. That argument doesn't make sense because NATO will not cross swords with Russia. And it's one of the things that I respect. Also, another thing as I look more and more into all of this, I, honest to God, I don't know if I sound like I'm circle drinking, I really do feel like Biden did everything perfectly for this. Um, and one of the things that Biden did in the very beginning of this was he very explicitly set this out that NATO will not, there is not gonna be, there's no no-fly zone over Ukraine. There are no NATO troops on the ground. Um, even the, the aid being sent, I think, to uh, Ukraine is not NATO aid, it's just aid coming from countries. Um, because he's very careful to read, because NATO is supposed to be a defensive alliance. It's not, you're not supposed to walk out and like, oh, we're using NATO to attack people. We're gonna go and kill fucking Russia now with NATO. So the idea that like, oh, well, if NATO's there, they're gonna attack Russia, why? That, there's, no, there's no reason to believe that. How do you think these sanctions are gonna fuck up Russia? It's hard to say, we'll see, I guess. Do you have an updated Steelman argument for the Russian perspective? No, I don't think you can steal man Putin's position. I think he's legitimately like a monster crazy dictator, dude. <laughs> I don't know if there's like a, um, I don't know if there's a good steel man position. For, well, I guess the steel man position is going to come not from justifying the invasion, but it's gonna be from like a, the, the Russian empire deserves to rise again as like a stalwart against Western corruption and degeneration and the inevitable collapse of all of like, you know, European and Western society and that Russia should stand on its own, with its own security interests, its own new countries, whatever, like as a, as an opposition to that. Imagine if Trump was president. We don't have to imagine if Trump was president. Anybody saying that Trump would have stopped it? Two huge problems. One, Donald Trump already withheld military aid from uh, Ukraine, Zelensky himself, who was asking for military aid, um, that was the reason why he got impeached the first time. Number one. Number two, Trump is also on record saying, well, because hey, yeah, I mean, wasn't Crimea basically all Russians anyway? Like, yeah, they can take it back. It's basically their shit anyway. So the idea that like Trump would step in now to help Ukraine after the dumb shit, no possible way. Dude. Thank you, Steve. Absolutely no shot. People that think that are fucking delusional. Do you have anything you've read compiled somewhere? Yeah, I actually made like a whole nice Google Doc and an outline or whatever, but I'm not gonna release it until after my debate with Jackson and or whatever, because I don't want I don't want them to like read and get like some weird esoteric snipes or whatever my shit. What's your stance on the West intervening? The you cannot have um, two nuclear powers shooting at each other ever. Can't do that. Uh, you just can't do that. Um, how did you start with researching all of this? I think the first question that I Googled was NATO promise no expand East. That's the first thing I looked at. Cause I was curious, like, was there, is there actually a record where, oh, NATO said they weren't gonna expand. There's not, it's never happened. Um, and then the most that I read individually about that was that there was this cache of documents and cables in 2017 that was declassified with the um, with the Bush Senior State Department and the conversations that uh, especially Secretary of State Baker was having with Gorbachev about how the reunification of Germany's gonna look, whatever. There's a whole bunch of shit related, released there that you can go and read through. There was this thing I had earlier. It's boring as fuck, but there's a lot of shit to read through there. Um, Oh, uh, fuck, it was one other thing I was gonna mention. I don't remember what it was now. There was a gentleman's agreement? No, there was no gentleman's agreement. This is not true, this is not true. There was no gentleman's agreement, there was no verbal agreement, there was no, no, none of that is true. None of that is true. Like, say what you want about the Soviets, but they weren't stupid. And you are making everybody sound like a Redditor, an epic Redditor, when you say like, oh yeah, you know, the two leaders of the world, the Soviet Union, 
the leader of the Warsaw Pact and the United States of America, the leader of NATO came together and behind closed doors, there was like a verbal agreement about the expansion of their alliance. Like, no, why would you be so fucking stupid to think that's the case? Like. Do you think that, do you think Russian leadership was that fucking stupid? Do you think Western leadership was that stupid? Like, I'm sorry, but even if I do agree and I grant you that, then I would say Russia deserved everything that came to them because how fucking dumb do you have to be that you got a verbal assurance? It's just, it's absolutely not true. Yeah, also, if you wanna talk, yeah, somebody mentioned this. There are like, how many agreements has Russia violated? So in, uh, is it 1994 or is it 2004? I have to, I'll, re, I'll remember, it might be 2004. I don't know how to spell this shit. So <clears throat> the Budapest Agreement, it was 1994. No, no, it was the Budapest Memorandum. So in 1994, um, three countries all came together to join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation non Treaty. Um, and in doing so, agreed to dismantle or sacrifice or get rid of all of their nuclear arms. Um, these three countries were, one was Ukraine, one was Belarus, um, and the other was, it was Ukraine, Belarus, and uh, Budapest Memorandum. Oh, and Kazakhstan. Um, part of that agreement, part of that agreement, when they said we're gonna give up all of our nuclear arms and shit, because we don't want every country to have nukes, was if we give our shit up, you have to promise that none of you guys are gonna fucking attack us, okay? Promise, because we're giving up our nukes, because now we're defenseless, okay? If I have nukes as Ukraine, I know that Russia's not gonna fuck with me. I'll give my nukes up, that's fine, but all you motherfuckers need to agree that you're not gonna fuck with me now, because I don't have any nukes to protect myself. The United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia all signed on to that. And I think Germany and France joined as co-signers later. And they're like, okay, fine. Give up your nukes, we won't attack you. And well, guess what Russia did, right? They, like, how, how can you talk about like violating like verbal agreements when you literally have something like that? Um, not to mention uh, other Russian agreements as well. There was the, um, there was the Paris Agreement, I think, that laid the foundation for later, uh, oh God, what was it? Like the OCHE or some shit? Uh, but there, there, Russia has made Russia has agreed to all sorts of agreements that is supposed to respect the autonomy of other countries and other like sovereign states. So they're not going to fuck with things or go in or take shit over or whatever. Like they've done this over and over and over and over again. Um, but they, but they keep doing it. It's like, and it's so flagrant. Uh, it's so flagrant how how they just yeah. The Russians are notorious for only respecting agreements, whether they be written or verbal, as long as people on them are strong enough to enforce them. Oh, sure. You're gonna get so fucking frustrated tomorrow because it'll be two and two. No, I told Dylan that Dylan, because I haven't followed any of the current war shit, because honestly, it's boring as fuck. I don't know why the fuck anybody cares about it. So he can do all that, but for the history stuff, that's gonna be my thing because I'm fucking ready to go on that shit. I just have to like review and make sure I have all like the names and dates and everything straight. I agree with the two nuclear powers should never go to war bit, but that means certain countries in NATO can never send aid in the form of actual military troops. It feels like NATO should get some of their NATO countries without nukes to help with the military. Okay, hold on. I, I haven't read directly, but I've read a lot of peripheral stuff, so you can tell me if I'm wrong. You can have troops that go and do things, but that doesn't make them NATO troops. Like, there is a NATO military presence where NATO will create an army and then go and like do things. But just because you're part of NATO doesn't mean every single time you send military troops or something that you're sending like NATO troops. It's not, it's not the same thing. Um, that being said, I don't think another NATO country could like send their military to go and help a non-NATO country because that would be weird. Um, yeah, the United States went to Iraq, not NATO. One of the huge follies under George Bush was him doing a horrible job and being antagonistic to the rest of the world when we went into Iraq um, because we did it unilaterally and it hurt US reputation abroad so much to, to do that um, without I keeping in mind our allies. Do you think if Putin goes after Estonia or something, NATO will actually defend it? it? That you have to. If you're in a NATO country and you get attacked, if you're not defended, then NATO falls apart immediately. But I've, I've also thought about like the doomsday shit that like, what if Russia's like, no, they won't because it will be nuclear war. And then Russia invades it and then sees what happened. I don't know what would happen at that point, but it would be crazy. But if NATO, um, 
if NATO, if a NATO country was invaded and we don't step in to defend it, then all, all of NATO falls apart. Did Ukraine make, in hindsight, a bad choice on nuke stuff, or was there no option? No, I think it's always good to get rid of, I, I think nuclear, plur, nuclear proliferation is a bad thing, and getting rid of more nuclear countries is probably a good thing. If a NATO country is attacked, doesn't mean you're at war with NATO, so there is no way to send troops from a NATO country to help without being at war with NATO. Well, no, it, it only, um, I, uh, I'd have to go read. I think to trigger Article 5, your troops have to be, your country has to be attacked. It can't just be your troops or something, right? So like if the United States sends soldiers to like South America to do some conflict, and then those soldiers get attacked, you, can, you can't trigger Article 5 and say, hey, NATO, come help us. We gotta, because they're like, no, hold on. Hey, <laughs> that wasn't in your country, bro. Um, I think the only time Article 5 has been triggered was, I think it was for 9-11. I think we triggered Article 5 for that. For the war on terror. When 9-11 happened, European countries did Article 5. I thought it was the United States that did it. But are you saying that the US ambassador to the Soviet Union at the time at the time saying is wrong about NATO expansion? Uh, with Russia, we kept expanding NATO, something uh, that uh, the first President Bush had promised Gorbachev we would not do. He, he's wrong. He, you can bring him on my stream, but after reading through, I've done nothing but the past week. His statement doesn't make sense. How can you talk about not expanding NATO? You know what? You know why I know this guy is wrong? Is because Gorbachev himself, um, Gorbachev himself um, literally said there were no talks of expanding NATO. He's gonna kill me. Um, fuck, where, I'm not gonna be, I have this written in another document. It's on my laptop or whatever. Um, but he, Gorbachev gave two interviews um, he, where he literally said, Gorbachev continued that the agreement on, the fi on a final settlement with Germany said that no new military structures would be created in the eastern part of the country. That's the no inch eastward thing. No additional troops would be deployed. No weapons of mass destruction would be placed there. It has been obeyed all these years. This is true. This is why we don't have military installations in eastern Germany. To be sure, the former Soviet president criticized NATO enlargement and called it a violation of the spirit of the assurances given Moscow in 1990, but he made clear that there was no promise regarding broader enlargement. Oh, and then here's this as well. Um, the interviewer asked why Gorbachev did not insist that the promises made to you, Gorbachev, particularly from the US Secretary of State James Baker, promised that NATO would not expand into the East be legally encoded. Gorbachev replied, the topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in those years. But think about it, like it makes sense. Why would you talk about NATO expansion, right? Poland was part of the Warsaw Pact. There's no place east for anybody to go. That like these countries were all still part of the Soviet Union. If we, if you look at like a map of like Warsaw Pact versus NATO map or whatever, right? What, what conversation are you gonna be having about like NATO expansion? Where the fuck is NATO going to expand to? I think these countries were explicitly declared non-aligned. I think they called themselves non-aligned countries. Um, but there, like, it, it doesn't even make sense that you would be having these conversations. Uh, there, there's, there's just no place for it to go. So no, I don't believe this guy. I don't know what he, I don't, I don't, I don't know why he's saying it or what his background is for saying it, or even if he was the ambassador of the Soviet Union. No, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Uh, if he had allowed the unification of Germany and Germany to stay in NATO. Step by step, we pulled out of even our most basic agreements and then and name one what agreement did the united states violate name it what is the agreement you won't be able to find it because there isn't a single one there isn't and that's why this guy's not going to be able to name any of them he won't be able to say any agreements like there was no agreement given increasingly uh, we uh, are surrounding russia uh with uh, right up to their borders right up to beyond their borders of the former Soviet Union with a military alliance which they are not in. Now, no leader of Russia, no leader of any other country could maintain a cooperative relationship and also uh, full democracy uh, in their country uh, uh, under uh, the conditions of that sort. But the problem is that the Soviet Union is unique and that the Soviet Union 
hard, even the United States doesn't go as far as the Soviet Union. It's like, if we see like interests that can align with us that we kind of like, but whatever, yeah, maybe, but we won't invade a country, overthrow the Republic and then install a leadership and then vote to like absorb that country into the United States, right? Like the Soviet Union is very unique in terms of like how they would fuck with neighbors and how they would take them over. Um, no, I, I don't agree with this guy. We got a boomer ambassador in discord room one. Do you think it's time to station nuclear warheads in Taiwan? China is too economically powerful to, wait, what? I don't know if that would, that, I feel like that would be like a Cuban Missile Crisis scenario. I might have an answer for why they keep hammering on the NATO thing. No, hold on. The, here, the answer is, is that when Vladimir Putin wants to talk, he'll just say random fucking shit or whatever, and he'll say that. And then as long as it sounds somewhat credible, people will go with it and that's it. The goal, when Putin talks, the goal isn't to be factually correct. The goal is to like weave a narrative or a story that kind of like sounds good enough to give people like something to grab onto and then you kind of like push forward that way. Like that's when Putin is talking, that's what Putin's talking. There's not like a, oh, well like let's use our brains to be give a charitable interpretation of it. Putin doesn't care to engage truthfully with the material. That's not his goal. Why would NATO not let Ukraine join or would they at all? I think when there were originally talks of Ukraine joining, um, it's always Germany and France. I think France is a little NATO skeptic. I don't remember. There's always a few countries in NATO that are like, hey, maybe we shouldn't let these people in because it's a little bit too antagonistic towards Russia. I think that's been the, um, I think that's been the reason why historically people haven't wanted people haven't really wanted these countries because I think we, we were in talks with Georgia as well. I think we promised, um, is it called a map? Member ascension path? Am I making that up? I don't remember. Um, but we, we'd given assurances to, I think, Ukraine and um, Georgia that if they wanted to join in, in the future, they'd be able to. But we're worried that it might be a little bit too, uh, it might be a little bit too antagonistic, so it hasn't happened in the past, but... Oh, membership action plan. That's what it is. MAP. Yeah. <clears throat> Haas is going to harp on the genocide in Donbass. 14,000 dead to Ukraine violated the Minsk Agreement. Azov Battalion being Nazis and why Ukraine elect Jewish president. He and the government president and how the U.S. feels. There, there was a NATO equivalent expanding in the U.S. Um, people keep trying to say it's comparable to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The problem with the Cuban Missile Crisis is that we saw um, the Soviet Union shipping missiles to Cuba and the the idea that it would like, I don't know if we were scared that it would hurt our second strike capabilities, but like the idea that nuclear missiles that close to your country was a little bit mind fucky. Um, my understanding, unless there's some top secret document that I'm missing or haven't seen, is that I don't think we've deployed nuclear weapons to um, to every single NATO state. Like I, like I don't think, for instance, like the Baltics, um, Latvia, Lithuania, and the, um, whatever the third one is called. Uh, Estonia. I don't think they have like nuclear weapons up there. Um, I think if they did, I'm pretty sure. Right, actually, I would know if they did because Russia would be screaming about it at the top of their lungs. Uh, Turkey has nuclear weapons, but but I don't even think that matters that much anymore because of how like the nuclear triad works, right? You're always going to have second strike or first strike capabilities. You've got subs, planes, um, ICBMs. I'm pretty sure every big country in the world now can strike any other place in the world. Like, I think Russia has enough nukes to destroy every U.S. city 50 times over and, like, still have some. It's, like, an insane amount. Do you think Putin could lose his next election in the economy if Russia gets getting worse? I don't know what's going to happen with Putin's popularity. Who knows? Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey have nuclear weapons. Funnily enough, no former Warsaw Pact members have nuclear weapons in their country, even though many are in NATO. But that's that, I think that's the goal. The reason why we want them to join NATO is so that we decrease nuclear proliferation. Because, hey, you're in NATO, you don't need nukes, we'll protect you. That's the point, right? It seems like you don't care about Russia at all, but rather making them suffer for the actions of Putin. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it works, right? If your country is doing insanely fucked up shit, uh, I mean, like, if you have that country has a certain leader, then the goal is to apply so much pressure that eventually the leadership changes. I mean, that's how that's how countries work. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. She told me when the cops came in last time, she was swinging a fucking katana around because she thought it was a joke. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but... I'm Russian. I don't have a single family member or friend who is supporting this popular default. Sure. That's cool that you don't, but my understanding is Putin is relatively popular when he's doing imperialistic shit. Now, maybe for Ukraine, his popularity will start to wane, but for Crimea, I think he had a surge of popularity when he did that shit. 
It doesn't make any sense for Russia to invade unless it was a NATO security issue. They knew they would get super fucked from the sanctions that they invaded. Why would you make such a fucking negative EV move if it wasn't for security? I don't get it. I think that what, so, so first of all, if you look at like the timeline, right? What was, what was the Crimea invasion a response to? It wasn't a response to NATO. It was a response to um, Yaku, Yanukovych. Fuck, I always forget his name. Yanukovych getting tossed. That was why they invaded. It had nothing to do with NATO. Like, it, it was because of that. Um, the um, So I've only read one thing on this, and I don't know how true it is. But my understanding is that Russia is increasingly trying to build itself up as some sort of autarky, and that when they lose trading partners with other people across the world, you're basically enriching more and more of the Russian oligarchs because, or oligarchs because their own families and their own corporations and their own businesses are going to be hopefully taking over that inside um, inside Russian borders. So it might be the case that at least Putin and his immediate like cabinet or business partners or crony comrades or whatever are all okay with the economic sanctions because it, in a roundabout way it will personally enrich them because it helps to centralize more and more power um, to like a select group of people that are running these industries. <clears throat> you are wrong about the NATO expansion stuff. It isn't written down, but in a, I, that's all you had to say. Hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring everything you said. If it's not written down, my dude, it's not an agreement. That's it. I don't I don't I don't care what else you have to type after that. But how do you think these things work? Like how could you be so stupid that just some guys like, bro, like no one'll do anything. And then like, what do you, that's not that's not how that works. Somebody linked this. So somebody says that at the bottom of page 6. Doesn't this show that they were talking about NATO? So <clears throat> Let's read uh, more context, okay? If Germany is neutral, it does not mean that it will not be militaristic. Quite the opposite, it could very well decide to create its own nuclear potential instead of relying on American nuclear deterrent forces. All our West European allies and a number of East European countries have made it known to us that they would like the United States to give its military presence in Europe. I do not know whether you support such a possibility, but I would like to assure you that as soon as our allies tell us that they are against our presence, we will bring our troops home. I do not know about your allies, but a united Germany may demand it. Baker, if that happens, our troops will return home. We will leave any country that does not desire our presence. The American people have always had a strong position favoring this. However, if the current West German leadership is at the head of a unified Germany, then they have said to us that they will be against our withdrawal. And the last point, NATO is the mechanism for securing the U.S. presence in Europe. If NATO is liquidated, then there will be no such mechanism in Europe. We understand that not only for the Soviet Union, but for other European countries as well, it is important to have guarantees that if the United States keeps its presence in Germany within the framework of NATO, not an inch of NATO's present military jurisdiction will spread in an eastern direction. This is referring to if the, if the German Democratic Republic reunifies with Western Germany, that NATO military expansion will not happen moving east into the reunified Germany. That's what this framework is talking about. Again, go look at the map of Germany. Go look at the map of the Warsaw Pact where NATO was. This statement doesn't make sense if you look at the time. Like, what, do you, what else could he be talking about? Like, we're not going to take a Poland from the Warsaw Pact? We're not going to capture your Warsaw Pact country and put it into NATO? Like, it doesn't make any sense. It means not an inch eastward all the way around the earth back to the middle of Germany. True, based. Haas gives the strongest argument for Russian belligerence. I've been trying to find some articles written by defense analysts that have reasonable predictions on the outcome of this war. Can you recommend any? There were a few Twitter accounts. There's one guy that was a, um, <sighs> fuck, what is he? he? I think he was a Russian military history analyst guy or whatever who has like, and I think he worked, he might've worked with the government for it and he gives like breakdowns or whatever. It, it, Michael Kaufman? If I see his thing, I might. Oh, it is this guy. I've read stuff by him. Um, and then there was one other Twitter account. But I read different stuff by different people, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, I feel like I recognize this guy's Twitter face. Is if you take this, you take all of this right here, 
This strip right here. Oh, this is cringe. I don't follow anybody that does this. I hated you guys when you did it. Um, and I hate anybody that starts drawing out like the, well, the reason why you need this is because you have the mountains here and they want to protect against the troop thirds here. So you need to take this. Gandalf will cast his magic here and you got to have the control. I don't, I don't, I don't give a fuck about any of that shit. I don't, I, I, I don't know how relevant any of that is to modern day military decision making. Like there are like, if you're talking about like defending or attacking like majorly aggressive areas, I'm, by the way, I don't know shit about this, so I could be wrong, but it seems to me that the most difficult combat to engage in is urban warfare. Not like, I don't know how to navigate the mountains. The mount, the river path gives them so much defensive capability. The hardest thing is civilians are shooting at us from fucking windows. I don't know what the fuck to do again. That seems to be the hardest part over fucking anything. Um, over over the like the obsession with like, we need to control the land math. Like, like it's for when, US, when the US ground army comes to invade, like, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just not as interested in that. Um, and then as I read, um, as I read more and more like geopolitical analysis, I, I, I just, I haven't heard anything about that ever, ever. Like, I don't see anybody talking about that. I do see people talk. So the one thing that is really important is access to the water. That seems to be really important. Um, so when we look at like uh, Crimea, the fact that there are, um, the, the fact that you get like the, the access to the whole Black Sea or whatever, there are, there are really important ports here that Russia uh, finds very valuable. Or um, down in Syria, uh, Tardis, I think here, like this port is really fucking important. So like having access to ports um, that can get you into different seas or different straits or whatever, like that can be an incredibly important thing. But I've never heard anybody say that like, well, from a geopolitical point of view, they really wanna capture this mountain range so that they can, their archers can shoot down on people. I've never, I just haven't seen that in modern day military or geopolitical analysis. Maybe it is, maybe there are people that talk about that. I just haven't seen those sources or I haven't read that thing, but I just, I don't see that being talked about ever. <clears throat> hmm. It's especially important since the war, since the more Northern port freezes in winter. So one that can use, yeah, that's why, um, I believe they call them warm water ports. I think that was one of, that's one of the huge strategic interests, um, for, uh, Syria, for, um, uh, for Putin. As I think Syria, it's either one of two or one of one. It might be the only warm water port they have access to. So even in the winter, it's not frozen. Oh, oil pipelines can also be relatively important too. Yeah. And it's a port not located in the Black Sea, so Turkey can't like them out of it, sure. What do you think about the video why Russia's invading Ukraine? Um, oh boy. This I, video was made possible I, by curiosity. I don't know. Guys, maybe I'm wrong about everything, so I always say this, take everything I say with a grain of salt, but when I go to do research on stuff, I really don't like watching videos. Um, I don't like watching videos. I much prefer to read things. Um, you can even make fun of like Wikipedia or whatever. I would much prefer somebody that just read all the Wikipedia articles than people that watch um, videos because videos can give you such a slant on things. It is so scary. You ha I think you have to read stuff. This is why when like stuff is going down and you guys are linking videos in chat, I'm very haphazard about watching videos because if I don't have a background on it, um, it just it's something that makes me like very nervous. Uh, this Gra the Gravel Institute video is a really good example of this. I don't think anything that's said in this Gravel Institute video is wrong, but it, the whole video is propaganda. It's so unimaginably one-sided while not necessarily saying anything that's factually incorrect. Uh, like, holy shit, this video is god awful. So I, I don't know, I just, I, I super like reading stuff. Um, stream in Nebula. Watch another brand new full length companion video to this one in my ongoing modern- Unless it's Dr. Mike videos. Conflict series that explains the entire course of the 2008 Russian invasion of Georgia, as well as the entire war so far between Russia and Ukraine since 2014 in the Donbass. All of which you can access by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle deal for less than $15 a year at curiositystream.com slash real life lore. Throughout the past few months, there has been almost constant news and coverage in the West about Russia's imminent plans to invade Ukraine. Started large-scale military drills this morning. And this is a very dangerous moment. Stoking fears of an invasion. More than 2,000 uh, troops, according to American intelligence, sent within the 24 hours. American citizens should leave, should leave now. On the morning of February the 24th, these fears proved to be well-founded. Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, effectively declared war on Ukraine and authorized the Russian military to invade the country. Explosions were quickly reported afterwards across the country. And immediately prior to this declaration, the Russian army had amassed around 200,000 soldiers, along with their tanks, artillery, equipment, and field hospitals across their border, and many others inside of Belarus along their border with Ukraine. For comparison, this is nearly the same size as the entire Ukrainian. The entire Ukrainian military is about 200,000 soldiers. The entire Russian military, I think, is around 900,000 soldiers.
military, and about the same number of troops sent by the United States when invading Iraq in 2003. This is certainly large enough to be an effective invasion force. Even further, the Russian government has recognized the independence of the two breakaway states inside of Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk, and ordered Russian troops inside of both. When factoring in the Russian military presence already stationed in Crimea, you can quickly begin seeing that the Russians have Ukraine almost entirely surrounded. And now that war has broken out, it has the potential to unleash the most serious conflict seen in Europe since the Second World War. And the biggest question on everybody's mind this entire time has been this. What exactly does Vladimir Putin and Russia want with Ukraine? And the answer is, of course, it's complicated. The origins of what Putin wants today are rooted in what happened more than three decades ago back in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union first collapsed. For centuries before this event, whether as part of the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire, the modern countries we know of today as Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and others had all been a part of the same country, and their people had largely moved between all of them across generations. These places are all deeply and intimately connected by their shared history, and for decades, that history involved being widely recognized as one of the world's most dominant and formidable global superpowers. But all of that changed in late 1991 when, suddenly, the sweeping united empire that had existed in some form or another for centuries collapsed and left in its place 15 newly independent republics. Today, the largest of them, Russia, has only half of the population that the former United Soviet Union had, and she possesses an economy that's only moderately larger than Spain's, a country with only a third of the population that ceased being a great power back in the 18th century. At the same time, the massive amounts of territories that were once dominated from the central government in Moscow have been shrinking almost continuously ever since. During the Cold War, there were two rival competing military alliances on the European continent, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in the West, and the Warsaw Pact in the East. Moscow didn't outright rule the countries of the Warsaw Pact, but they were effectively locked into Moscow's orbit as thralls or puppet states. From Moscow's perspective, these states provided a massive buffer against any potential military incursion from their primary Cold War rivals to the West in NATO. You see, from the Netherlands in the West to the Ural Mountains in the East, this whole part of Europe is dominated by a geographic feature called the North European Plain. Almost entirely flat, the plain is shaped like a funnel, with a very narrow width in northern Germany, but with a mouth that opens up increasingly wider as it approaches the Ural Mountains. As the open plain gets wider across the East, it becomes increasingly difficult to defend across its entire length, and as a result, from the perspective of any regime based in Moscow, regardless of the time period and regardless of the ideology, it is imperative to expand control westwards across as much of this open plain as possible in order to narrow the gap that they need to defend in the event of a conflict with the West. During the Cold War, the control of this plain by a regime in Moscow was at its greatest historical extent and was exerted either outright or by proxy from the Urals all the way through East Germany. And the entire wider section of the funnel was firmly controlled by Moscow, with Austria and Finland remaining neutral and Yugoslavia a non-aligned communist state. The only fronts that Moscow at the time had to truly worry about against NATO were across the Sudeten Mountains, the Black Sea, and a narrow line across the North European plain in central Germany. All easily defensible positions. Any invasion of the Soviet world from the West across these geographic frontiers would have been incredibly difficult. But in the 30 years since 1991, the situation has changed dramatically against Moscow's favor. Today, the former Warsaw Pact territories of East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria are all a part of NATO, while the former Soviet republics themselves of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia all are as well. This reality has pushed the NATO front lines significantly further to the east across the wider section of the North European plain, and has separated Russian territory between the mainland and the Kaliningrad exclave here across what's known as the Suvalki Gap. If you're sitting in the Kremlin in Moscow and you still believe that NATO is a hostile military alliance, or could become one in the future, then this situation understandably looks pretty grim. But it's not totally lost yet. In the years following the breakup of the Soviet Union, many of the newly independent republics established and joined their own military alliance called the Collective Security Treaty Organization, or CSTO, which in Europe consists of Russia, Belarus, and Armenia, but not Ukraine, which has remained a sort of neutral zone between NATO in the West and the CSTO in the East. And now, within this lens, you can easily see why Ukraine is currently and always will be a geographic core interest to Moscow. If Ukraine is within Moscow's orbit, then it pushes the CSTOs and Moscow's defensive lines to the Carpathian Mountains in the Southwest, and it narrows their exposure across the North European plain to only the eastern border of Poland. And while the Baltic states do lie across the plain as well, CSTO forces could easily encircle them by rapidly advancing across the narrow Suvalki Gap between Kaliningrad and Belarus and cut them off from the rest of NATO, meaning that they aren't as grave of a geographical threat. Conversely, however, if Ukraine became a NATO member state, it would surge the NATO front lines far beyond the Carpathian Mountains and far across the wider section of the North European plain and place the new defensible front line across nearly 2,300 kilometers of open, hard to defend flat land, the easternmost section of which would only be a little Here's more- Here's the only thing I don't understand about stuff like this. People talk about like the geography, right? Like, I just don't understand how two nuclear powers are supposed to go to war with each other. Cause it's not like you're ever gonna lose, right? You just start nuking each other. That's why I don't understand the, like, or do we just go to war with each other and hope that nobody nukes each other? This is what I don't understand. I don't think, that's why I don't think the ground war conversations are relevant when it comes to nuclear powers. But I, I don't know than 300 kilometers away from Volgograd, which, if taken, would shut down the entire Volga River and cut off Russia's valuable oil and gas resources coming up from around the Caspian Sea from the rest of the country, as nearly happened during the Second World War, back when the city was better known as Stalingrad. Even further, Belarus, a friendly and loyal CSTO state that is often considered a mere extension of Moscow itself, would suddenly become an indefensible salient protruding deep into the NATO front lines, surrounded entirely by NATO territory on three flanks. Thus, Ukraine's outright control by Moscow, or at least neutrality, is essential to the defense of the CSTO and Russia, if you believe that NATO is a hostile aggressor or could become one in the future. But all 
this is really only the beginning of what Russia and Putin want from Ukraine. The biggest thing they want of all is energy. While their overall economy is a little larger than Spain's, Russia remains a global superpower through the lens of energy resources. And it's specifically oil and gas that is the most critical component to understand about Russia's worldwide ambitions. Across multiple vast oil fields, Russia is the world's second largest producer of oil ahead of even Saudi Arabia. While at the same time, Russia also possesses the world's largest proven reserves of natural gas, largely across Siberia, which has enabled Russia to become the world's leading exporter. Do you think the U.S. has a good enough missile defense system to nullify pretty much any Russian attack? Absolutely not. Anybody that says otherwise is clueless or is lying to you. Um, intercontinental ballistic missiles travel incredibly quickly. Um, the warhead split like crazy. Uh, you have no idea. You don't even know where all the nukes are going to come from. Because at any point in time, you could have submarines coming up from like the fucking in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Oh shit, and you're getting fucking nuked. You don't even know it. Um, you've got hypersonic like splitting fucking warheads. You like there's you're, there's no way like. The mutually assured destruction absolutely exists. Um, you have no idea, like the, the, the idea that you could stop like all the nuclear uh, attacks or whatever is just not, not reasonable of natural gas. The revenues gained from the sale of all these oil and gas exports are the literal foundation for the modern Russian state and Russian power, because they provide as much as 50% of the entire Russian government's budget and represent about 30% of Russia's entire GDP. Russia has used the vast money earned from selling oil and gas abroad to fund their military, pay off debts, save cash, and finance its own restoration as a global great power. Russia is therefore effectively a petrostate, just like Saudi Arabia or Iran, and is the only petrostate located in Europe, at least for now. For you see, despite these massive geological blessings, they also come with a number of geographical catches from Moscow's perspective. Perspective. Most of their gas is sold off to the hungry customers in the European Union, so much so that 35% of the EU's entire gas supply comes from Russia alone, including Germany, the world's fourth largest economy, who imports nearly half of their natural gas from Russia. This flow of gas towards Germany and Europe across this complex system of pipelines provides critical revenues for the Russian government to function and provides critical heat for European cities during the winter. And so both sides heavily rely upon the other here. Any disruption in this trade relationship would be disastrous from Moscow's perspective. And Ukraine is- Hold on, a NATO border approaching Moscow probably drastically reduces their response time for a nuclear strike? No. Um, you always have something called COG, uh, continuance of government, and you always have, that, so people refer to this as your second strike capabilities. You always have second strike capabilities if you're a nuclear power. Uh, you will always have planes, other uh, nuclear installations, other submarines that are able to emerge and destroy things. Like you're never gonna lose your second strike just because somebody nukes you from close range or whatever. This is never gonna be the case most likely place for such a disruption to happen in the future. Back during the Soviet times when Russia and Ukraine were both one country, pipelines were built across Ukraine almost like a bridge that transported gas directly from the Siberian sources to the customers in Europe. But then, all of a sudden, after the USSR's collapse, Ukraine was an independent country who was demanding tariffs to the tune of billions of dollars a year from Russia in order to continue using their country as a gas bridge to Europe. And Russia had no other choice but to agree, because the pipeline infrastructure anywhere else didn't yet exist. As late as 2005, 80% of Russia's gas exports heading to Europe were still flowing across pipelines. What do you read about these geopolitical analysis? I've only read news articles about this and haven't heard about the important things. I haven't heard about the importance about things water. <sighs> Hold on. Let me try to read this sentence one more time. I have only read news articles about this and haven't heard about the importance about things water. I can't, I can't do this. I, I'm on no sleep, I'm sorry. Pipelines through Ukraine. But in the decades since, Russia has sought to solve this over-reliance on Ukraine by building multiple new pipelines that avoid Ukraine entirely, like Yamal Europe across loyal Belarus, Nord Stream 1 and 2 beneath the Baltic that go directly from Russia to Germany, Moscow's largest single customer, along with South Stream, Blue Stream, and Turk Stream beneath the Black Sea. By 2024, Russia has plans to completely cease all of their- If one can only rely on nukes, why does NATO have conventional army and not just nukes since no one invades a country with nukes? Because we can go to war with countries that don't have nukes. That's the whole point of proxy wars. Like, it's fun to go and bully countries that are not nuclear powers because they can't fight back with nuclear weapons. So we can do a lot of shit in the Middle East. Um, we can do a lot of shit in South America. We can do a lot of shit theoretically in certain places in Asia, um, maybe Africa. Uh, but like if a country has nukes, you can't fuck with them. But if they don't have nukes, then you it's like free reign to do whatever the fuck you want gas exports through Ukraine entirely, and the government will save billions of dollars in tariffs as a result. But that is hardly what has been so threatening about Ukraine recently. Significantly more menacing to the perspective of Moscow was the discovery for the first time in early 2012 that Ukraine's exclusive economic zone within the Black Sea may contain more than two trillion cubic meters worth of natural gas, largely concentrated around the Crimean Peninsula. To make matters even more interesting, further technological advancements in the early 2010s that enabled the successful drilling of natural gas and oil from shale rock unlocked the potential shale gas hotspots for Ukraine around Donetsk and Kharkiv in the east and around the Carpathians in the west. Beginning in 2012, there was suddenly a very real possibility that almost 
because out of nowhere, Ukraine had the world's 14th largest reserves of natural gas. Wait, then isn't the incentive to always have nukes? If everyone has nukes, no one goes to war. Exactly. That's the whole point. That's why we try to so aggressively expand NATO is because every new country you wrap into the alliance is one less country that will pursue a nuclear weapons program and another country that hopefully won't get attacked by anybody. So it ensures stability. That's the whole point of expanding these military alliances is to reduce nu nuclear proliferation just behind Australia and Iraq. But as a relatively poor country, Ukraine lacked the finances, the technology, or the equipment to successfully harvest any of these resources in any large quantities. But that all changed when, shortly afterwards, the Ukrainian government began granting exploration and drilling rights to the likes of Shell and Exxon. It was suddenly possible that within a few years, these Western companies would enable Ukraine to transform into Europe's second petrostate, which would have not only been a direct and serious competitor to Russia's own gas supply to the European Union, and thus at the same time, a major threat to the Russian government's budget and GDP, but would have also provided the easy path of eventual Ukrainian Um, Russia has displayed as a shitty outdated army. Maybe their nuke and submarine capabilities are garbage too. Um, why would you think that? I don't know if nuclear technology, it has to be that complicated. Like when was the first ICBM tested? Was it in the fifties or how, how, what is the, when, um, first ICBM from 1954 to 1957. So we represent like inter intercontinental ballistic missiles have been around for like, like six or seven decades. They're not that complicated, right? And like, there's other things that you can work on. And then you still have like submarines all over who the fuck knows where in the world that can um, surface at any point in time and start shooting missiles at people. Like you're, <clears throat> mission into the European Union and NATO as well. And this is what's really, in my opinion, what this whole situation is truly about. In 2012, at the time when these discoveries were initially made, the man in charge of Ukraine was Viktor Yanukovych, a pro-Russian- Didn't you say that attacking NATO troops isn't attacking individual countries? So how would NATO be a better deterrent than nuclear weapons? NATO was in effect, because let's say if we look at countries like Poland or like Romania or Hungary or whatever, okay? These are countries that if, if you start having a little bit of a problem in your country and you're bordering Russia, Russia might look at you and be like, hey, I think there's an opportunity here for me to go and take some shit from you. I'm going to go fuck your shit up. But if you're in NATO, Russia can't send troops in or funnel weapons over or send like like military assistance or whatever to these um, to these groups, or whatever. Right. You can't um, you can't do that to a NATO country. That's that's why being in NATO is nice. You're kind of you're protected against like the fucky bullshit that other larger superpowers ever want to do to you, you know. So why join NATO over just having nukes? Because developing your own nuclear weapons program and everything is expensive because it's scary for the whole world. Because why would you take care of your security when the United States can take care of your security for you? And because nobody else in the world wants you to get nukes. That was part of the reason why up through the 90s, the Soviet Union was, uh, not the Soviet Union, I'm sorry, but it would have been Russia past the 90s, um, past 91, was okay with NATO expanding through Europe because it ensured security. And it meant that fewer people were, um, we're, we're pursuing nuclear weapons programs and it ensured some level of stability across Europe as well. Technically, everybody wanted stability across Europe. Even um, after the Soviet Union fell, even Russia and everybody else still wanted stability across Europe. Like nobody wanted everything to get fucked and weird and crazy. This is why the United States didn't want the Soviet Union to fall um, because, it, because we were really worried that when the, when the Soviet Union fell that like every single satellite republic would like fall into disarray and it would become this huge chaotic tumultuous event, tumultuous? Tumultuous event uh, in history, which it didn't for some reason. But <clears throat> Hold on, I, this guy is like hardcore schizo, super schizo posting in chat. I don't know anything about this. Hassan keeps saying it's not like NATO is bad for Ukraine and it's more negative than positive. If Hassan says that, it's because Hassan is an uneducated dipshit. If Hassan had any respect for any of humanity whatsoever, he would have removed himself from this entire situation when he demonstrated how hilariously inept he was in the beginning by claiming that every single US report that was being declassified and released about Russian military capabilities was all Western propaganda. That's what Hassan would have done. If you get something that wrong, you probably should shut the fuck up and step back and, and let somebody that will like read one paragraph on Wikipedia be more informed 
than you about the issue, talk about it. Um, it. That was like embarrassing. I do really like though, that Asana's like totally bought into like the rich man shit um, of like anytime something happens, he'll like make a fundraiser or he'll like donate money to some shit to save his reputation, which is really funny because I'm pretty sure I've heard him make the specific argument before that charity is really bad because corrupt capitalist countries can maintain whatever programs they're doing by relying on the charity of people in order to kind of like brush everything else under the rug. And that's kind of what he does. Anytime he massively fucks something up because his brain is the size of a fucking pea, he'll like donate a hundred thousand dollars or some dumb shit. I don't even know if it was his money. I think it was shit he raised off of his fucking simp audience. Um, so yeah, no, I, like, I don't know. I would ignore everything Assange says on stage. He doesn't know anything about any of this. <clears throat> politician who is keeping Ukraine more politically aligned with the interests of Moscow. So long as he was president, these discoveries were not directly threatening to Russia. But when suddenly in February 2014, his government was toppled. Nukes are only good if they can get past missile defense systems. That's why Russia was raging about missile defense systems being put in Poland. I don't know if it's possible to intercept an ICBM because those, those rockets literally fire into outer space. Um, let's see if I can remember my, my Metal Gear Solid 1 uh, prologue. Um, I could be wrong, but I think an ICBM will fire literally like into the atmosphere. Um, and then it will, I think it does like a little propulsion thing. It like finds its target and then it drops from here. And these things are moving incredibly fast. Um, and, uh, and I think they're complicated enough at this point that like multiple warheads can split off of like one ICBM. Like they're just, they move incredibly fast. They're very, very hard to counter. And you could be launching thousands of these things. And you only have to miss like three or four to be fucked, right? Like, oh shit, like we intercepted 95% of the ICBMs. Oh, good job, sir. We've only got like four of them headed to New York now. You know, only a few are landing in every major US city. Not to mention, these are only the ICBMs that you can see launching from Russia, right? Missile defense platforms in Eastern NATO countries aren't gonna protect you from submarines emerging in the Pacific Ocean to start nuking the West Coast of the United States, right? That's not gonna help either, you know, but. Yeah, not to mention you can have dummy warheads, you get there's all like nuclear there's mad very much still exists in the world. Destiny, you can intercept individuals from rogue states, you can't stop mad. Yeah, like if if North Korea had like four ICBMs that they were ready to launch in the United States, I'm confident. Uh, I would put money on it that the United States could probably deal with it. We probably have some tech to deal with it. But Russia? Fuck no, you're fucked. Absolutely fucked. In a pro-EU and pro-Western revolution in Kiev, I Moscow was very quick to take the opportunity to invade some of Ukraine, seize the Crimean Peninsula, and annex it in the name of historical claims and protecting ethnic Russians. But by seizing Crimea, the Russians also took direct control of two-thirds of Ukraine's coastline and, by extension, the vast majority of Ukraine's maritime exclusive economic zone. And, most critically, an estimated 80% of Ukraine's Wait. potential- Wait. Somebody said, are these nukes not getting so old that they'd be unreliable? Did they really design these missiles to last forever? I, I think, isn't it all pretty simple tech? I could be wrong, but like, cause people say it's not rocket science. Aren't rockets pretty easy? Isn't it pretty simple shit? Like you put a ton of fucking fuel in a thing, as long as you have the math checks out, like they, you fire them and they go and they do their thing. It's not like, it's not brain surgery, you know? Um, nukes decay over time. I don't know if fissionable material in a nuclear missile decays in a, in a way that is adverse to the, I, I don't know. But you, but all of these countries can enrich probably their own nuclear materials anyway. So it's they, I'm sure they maintain their weapons and everything too. Um, yeah offshore oil and gas reserves. In addition, billions of dollars worth of drilling equipment and other assets in the peninsula were seized by the Russians, all of which completely crippled the Ukrainian government's future potential to challenge Russia's gas supremacy in Europe. To make matters even worse from Ukraine's perspective, the areas of Ukraine that are the most rich in shale gas are located very near to the most major conflict zones encouraged and funded from Moscow, with the Donetsk and Luhansk rebellions here and the Transnistria breakaway Republic in Moldova. Do you think American media is spreading misinformation? If they are, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I think Biden did a really good job at declassifying and releasing intel about everything going on over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and Putin doesn't give a fuck about the truth or any part of it. So it's pretty easy to be factually in the right here. Not to say that they haven't fucked up. They, I, if, if the mainstream media has lied or gotten some shit wrong, I haven't seen it yet, but they could have, and I just haven't seen it yet. Um, over here, which, in my view, is not a coincidence. As a result, Shell and Exxon both backed out from all of their contracts with the Ukrainian government shortly afterwards, leaving Ukraine with no capability to extract the remaining resources themselves, and no capability to challenge Russia's occupation of Crimea. From the perspective of Putin and his regime, these were all- Does NATO not work against Russian interests and diminish Russian security? Those interests might not be good, but they make sense if Russia are seeking to maximize security. Well, that's the thing. In the mid 90s, we were having talks with Russia. Because I'm putting 100%- At one point, we almost considered having Russia join um, NATO, but I think, I think it was Putin that ultimately decided against that. Um, but uh, like NATO can also serve to 
uh, can, can serve to strengthen Russian security interests as well. Um, another example of this was in 2001, after 9-11, there was a lot of communication between NATO and Russia for terrorist activity. That was a really big thing. And I think some people thought moving forward that there was gonna be like more partnership, more um, joint activity or an intelligence sharing order between Russia and NATO because of the war on terror. But um, I, I think for reasons like that started to fall apart and yeah. actions to take in order to curb a Western-oriented Ukraine from ever selling major supplies of gas to Europe that would threaten his own regime's primary source of wealth and power. Ukraine had to be dismembered to protect himself and the other oligarchs who are in power. But there's more. Under Putin, Russia can't ever give Crimea back to Ukraine because it would surrender the entire exclusive economic zone and all of the gas resources within it back, along with the strategic port city of Sevastopol, one of the very few year-round ice-free ports that the Russian Navy can use and needs to operate throughout the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. If Crimea was ever returned to Ukraine and Ukraine joined NATO, they would regain their ability to threaten the Russian government's primary source of revenue, and the Russian Navy's most geostrategically valuable port would be lost forever, but Ukraine has some pressure that it can and has been applying itself. Naturally speaking, the geography of Crimea is that it's almost an island, only loosely connected to the rest of Europe and covered by dry and arid steppes and some salty marshes with very little fresh water for people or agriculture. Prior to the Russian invasion and annexation, the vast majority of Crimea's fresh water supply, like 85% of it, came down into the peninsula from a canal built during the Soviet era that diverted water from the Dnieper River. But after the Russians took it over in 2014, the Ukrainians weren't exactly in the mood to continue sending down the water. Do you think Putin is ideologically driven? Absolutely, I think so, yeah and they filled up the canal within their remaining borders to the north with cement and blocked the flow of all this water down into the now Russian-occupied Crimea. As a result, Crimea has ever since been essentially dying a death from a thousand cuts, as it steadily recedes back into the dry and arid steppe of history, while modern climate change is only making everything even worse, as 2020 was the driest year ever on record in Crimea since record-keeping began 150 years ago. As a result, the Russian government is struggling to maintain its hold. The capital city- Wait, why? Okay, hold on. Why is this guy mad at me saying Merv? Destiny is a retard calling ICBMs Mervs. What do you what do you mean by that? Why am I retarded? ICBMs, you were calling multiple warheads ICBMs. Okay. An ICBM is not a warhead. An ICBM is just a delivery vehicle. My understanding is that you could put a MERV on an ICBM. Is that not true? An ICBM is just a rocket. You can crash a rocket anything. And you can put a space shuttle in an ICBM. An ICBM is just a rocket. It flies. Fucking dubstep. But a MERV is a um it's, it's like a multiple re-entry vehicle. I don't remember what the fucking acronym is. But I, my understanding is you can put a MERV, like MERV warhead can go on top of an ICBM, or a nuke can go on top of an ICBM, or a conventional rocket or missile can go on top of an ICBM or some sort of explosive. But an ICBM, ICBM doesn't mean anything. Like, like bombing wise. ICBM is just a rocket. It flies. That's just, like I think, I think, um, didn't, um, Sputnik? I think somebody chats, didn't Sputnik go up on an ICBM? Um, Destiny, you're just wrong, Giga Chad. ICBM just means long range missile. ICBM means intercontinental ballistic missile. An ICBM is a vehicle that is capable of traveling, I don't know what the minimum length is, but like, I think anywhere around the world, basically. If you have an ICBM, the idea is that it can go anywhere. But you can put a MERV, a MERV warhead, I believe, can go on top of a ICBM. I feel like I've oh, let's just look, why am I arguing about this? ICB, MERV. ICBM, we'll just look it up. Maybe Merv has its own rocket system. Okay, I don't know. The United States was the first country to develop Merv technology, deploying a Merv ICBM in 1970. Okay, there, so fuck you, suck my dick. Okay, shut the fuck up. You're the retard. Okay, we're for, I don't know why we're watching this, okay. The city Simferopol's reservoir is, today, less than 7% full, and the city has been having to ration water supplies. Even after the Russians built a nearly $4 billion bridge across the Kerch Strait here to connect the peninsula over to the Russian mainland, shipping in water is difficult, and life for the more than 2 million people on the peninsula is getting harder after the annexation, not better. The Russian government is having to spend billions of dollars a year to financially prop up Crimea, and it's largely all because of this canal being shut down by the Ukrainians over on the other side. And Ukraine is obviously not in any kind of mood to open it back up again. As a result, the current crisis in Ukraine can also be seen through the lens of climate and water conflict, and it's one of the biggest reasons why Russia is doing what it's doing now. The current Prime Minister of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has stated on multiple occasions that the primary goal going forward for the Ukraine... in five minutes. ...to allow for additional weight and... ...we show the penades, or decoys, in red, and the re-entry vehicles, or RVs, in black. At a predetermined point of the trajectory, the post-boost vehicle, or bus, begins to maneuver into position for its first drop-off. Visible on the bus, 
are the two RVs and several decoys which are in the stowed position. The decoys are placed on the bus in this manner to maximize packaging. At the first drop-off point, a decoy is released. The bus then continues to maneuver to the next drop-off position where an RV is released. Also visible is the first deployed decoy which inflates to fully simulate the optical signature of the RV. The bus will now complete its pre-programmed routine and deploy all of the remaining vehicles into two trains of objects. The decoys and RVs are optically... I have an important message for you guys. Obamna. <laughs> ...indistinguishable as they travel in the exo Thank you, Stephen! When the re-entry train reaches the endo-atmosphere, the pyro motors on the vehicles ignite. The exo-replication inflatable splits in half and peels away. At the same time, the RV shroud, which is composed of the same materials as the decoy inflatable, also splits in half and separates concurrent with motor ignition. The endo decoy has begun to optically mask itself using its pyrotechnic motor. Inside the motor, we see the twin stage configuration with the grain burning on the first stage, followed by the second stage at a predetermined time. Similarly, we see the modular dual stage motor, which optically masks the RV. Wow. The decoys burn up as the RVs successfully penetrate the defenses. Why? Oh, League of Levers, I got it. 